Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Africa News with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight we head to Kenya, where criticism of the government's roundup of Somali refugees is gathering momentum. Around 4,000 people have so far been detained in the week since the security measure was first launched. Also president in January, prime minister in April. One of the world's poorest countries, Madagascar, has finally got a new premier. He'll be heading up efforts to restore international confidence in the nation's tattered economy. And we take a look at the concerns of Ivorians three years to the day after the arrest of former president Laurent Bagbo ended months of bloody post-electoral conflict. First up, political opposition to the Kenyan government's mass roundup of ethnic Somalis is gathering momentum. The crackdown seen 4,000 people arrested. It began a week ago as part of an anti-terror sweep by security forces and is officially aimed at Somali refugees. Critics, though, of the policy say it's amounting to the creation of concentration camps and claim the Kenyan citizens are also being seized. It is one of thousands of people arrested over the last week. He says he was held overnight, despite being a Kenyan national with a valid ID card. Detained alongside his housemate, a fellow Kenyan, they say they were only freed after paying a fine for loitering and drunkenness, despite being observant Muslims. I used to treat myself that I'm a Kenyan. I have the right for anyone, any Kenyan, the right he has. I used, I used to do that. But uh, from tonight, uh, uh, I see myself that I'm discriminated. I just, I'm like a third class citizen. So many people have been arrested here in Nairobi that it's been impossible to find enough police cells to hold them all in. As a result, many have ended up at this stadium behind me here, leading to allegations that the Kenyan security forces have established a de facto concentration camp. Panya fled war in Somalia to Kenya with a cousin and other relatives three years ago. She says her cousin was arrested on April 3rd and is still being held in the stadium. We try to go and visit him and take some clothes to him. But in the end, we decided not to go inside the stadium because we are afraid. We have the same refugee idea as he has. And we are afraid we may also be arrested. Some detainees, even those with no ID papers at all, have allegedly bribed their way out of custody. Human Rights Watch claims that the detentions are illegal. The police say that the stadium is serving as a temporary screening facility and that they've not received any official complaints about bribery. But they're appealing for people to come forward. Whether it's the police conduct, whether uh, they have been asked to give money, or whether they have even seen people being released unfairly, these people have a civic duty and an obligation to come and formally report to us. Kenya has a growing problem with Islamic extremism. At Friday prayers at a radical mosque in Mombasa earlier this month, a preacher called on followers over the public address system to arm themselves with knives and slaughter non-believers. Kenya's defence ministry says its troops have freed two nationals kidnapped by al-Shabaab militants back in 2011. The pair are thought to be James Kiari Gyuchiu and Daniel Juguna and were reportedly in an incoherent state when found in Somalia near the shared border between the two countries. The president took office back in January and today Madagascar finally also has a new prime minister. Colo Christopher Laurent Roger is a radiologist who's lived abroad for decades and is a total unknown to his country's political scene. The 70-year-old faces the tough task of reviving the economy of one of the poorest nations in the world. The World Bank had warned that the resumption of lending, suspended after a coup in 2009, would hinge on the naming of a new premier. Well, President Rajna Rampian has responded to questions about Roger's political experience, insisting that he does have what it takes. You say he has no political experience because he has not graduated from an elite school. That's what people used to tell me back in the day. You have no political experience. And I used to tell people, where should political experience start? In which school? I do think Mr. Prime Minister has conviction, will, and understanding of the good of all. And above all, what he has, and I know he does, is patriotism.
il a ça, c'est le patriotisme. Guinea-Bissau heads to the polls this weekend as voters choose a new president and parliament. The country is looking to return to democracy after two troubled years under the military-backed transitional government that took over after a coup in 2012. Well, our Julia Sega has more. The campaign is wrapping up under the attentive eye of ECOWAS observers. As many as 700,000 Guineans will cast their vote on Sunday. These presidential and legislative elections are seen as a milestone in a country that has suffered five military coups in the last three decades. I'm hopeful. I hope that God will reveal to us somebody who can take us out of our problems. Military chief Antonio Injai launched a coup in 2012, toppling then Prime Minister Carlos Gomez Jr. during the second round of the presidential runoff. Since then, elections have been postponed twice. So this time around, people are hoping the ballot will bring back lasting peace and stability. We are hoping that the elections will bring Guinea-Bissau out of the crisis. Everybody's simply mistrusting. We'll be following what happens closely. Among the 13 presidential candidates, former finance minister José Mario Vaz from the Independence Party is considered the front-runner, followed by Abel Incada from the Party for Social Renewal. But both traditional parties face a strong challenge from independent candidate Paolo Gomez, an internationally renowned economist. The next president will face the challenge of ending the army's political influence. He'll also need to bolster the fight against drug trafficking. The country has become a major transit point in the smuggling of South American cocaine into Europe. Algeria also goes to the polls, but that is on April 17th. But for the 800,000 Algerian citizens due to vote in France, polling starts on Saturday. Organizers are keen to encourage the overseas electorate to turn out, opening over 200 voting stations across France. Well, France Vincat's visited one of those in the suburbs of Paris. Algeria's presidential elections are set for the 17th of April, but here in France, they begin on Saturday. At this polling station in Paris's outer suburb of Nanterre, staff were making final preparations after months of work, sending out a final reminder to voters with every last detail on where and how they can vote. We tell them the address, the means of transport, whether it's bus, train or metro, the stations where they can get off. It's all to make it as easy as possible for them to at least show up. The Algerian consulates made some changes for this election. They've opened some 200 voting stations around France in the hope of attracting more voters to the ballot boxes. There were some 800,000 Algerian voters registered in France. Around half of them have dual nationality. President Abdelaziz Bouteflika is widely expected to win another term, despite his flailing health, which means he's unable to campaign. The opposition say he's not fit for office. Mm. Well, today marks three years since the arrest of former President Laurent Gbagbo ended four months of civil strife in Ivory Coast. More than 3,000 people were killed in post-electoral violence that followed Gbagbo's refusal to acknowledge electoral defeat by current President Alassane Ouattara. Today, Gbagbo is facing crimes against humanity charges in The Hague and Ouattara's administration still struggling to reconcile with the opposition and encourage the return of refugees who fled. Many Ivorians are still living with the scars of the conflict. In the west side of the capital, residents recall the post-election horrors of April 11, 2011. In response to the arrest of former President Laurent Gbagbo, his supporters attacked Muslims in the area. I was coming from Friday prayers. We were heading home when pro-Bagbo militias followed us. They started shooting at us. I caught a bullet in my spine, and I've been paralyzed ever since. The mosque and houses were set on fire and the casualties mounted. In mere hours, the public square was transformed into a mass grave. More than 110 people were killed that day. On that day, they almost killed me right here. I escaped. I ran all the way over there. I saw corpses, burnt bodies. No one could have imagined it. I saw so many things then. Conflict broke out when Bagbo refused to acknowledge defeat to Alassane Ouattara. Independent monitors said Ouattara won. 
but Gbagbo supporters felt they were somehow cheated. April 11th was a day of shock, a nightmare. For all the things they say about Laurent Gbagbo, everything they accuse youth leader Blegu Day of, we have to sit down and find out the truth and find out who really committed these crimes. Calm has returned to this part of town, and Hotel de Golf, which was Watara's bunker-like headquarters in 2011, is no longer the center of a set-piece battle for power. The country is now reconciled and the political parties discuss things in the permanent committee of dialogue. You can see today practically three-quarters of refugees have come back to the Ivory Coast. But divisions do remain, and the government will be keen to prevent them from triggering trouble in the run-up to the elections next year. That's it for African News from me. For this week, I'll be back with more on Monday. Stay with us on news and headlines coming up. Take care.